ladies and gentlemen, podcast number 28, and uh, uh, it's, it's, they're all very novel and differing greatly from one another, but this 28th one, it may surprise you considerably. It is the Xi Jing, or Book of Songs, which is China's oldest collection of uh, verse. Uh, and now China is one of the oldest cultures in the world, and its oldest collection of verse is something old. That is from the uh, the poets, the anonymous poets, all are anonymous, uh, date from, as estimated, the uh, 1100s to the 700s BCE, before Jesus, before Socrates, before Buddha, and even before considerably before Confucius, although some people call them the Confucian odes. Uh, many of them are not odes, and none of them are by Confucius, though it was claimed uh, he compiled them, but that's been disproven. Uh, instead, what I use is a modern version uh, of these beautiful things, uh, which uh, came to us in the most unusual way. I'll explain. Uh, what happened was a Jesuit priest... Uh, among those who wished to convert uh, uh, the Chinese to Catholicism, uh, was uh, appointed imperial interpreter uh, after he had learned Chinese extremely well, and he translated all of them. Uh, the, tr the trouble is only that he translated them into, what should we say, into Latin prose, and that wasn't terribly helpful if you are a poet or just a person who likes good word song and uh, wanted to read something to enter entertain you. Uh, but Friedrich Rückert, the, uh, that would be pronounced in English Rückert, uh, Rückert in, uh, in Germany in, uh, was very attentive when this uh, new, recently rediscovered manuscript of 1733 uh, had been reprinted in 1830 in Stuttgart in Germany, and he was in, enthralled by the Latin prose that he read. Uh, only trouble is he felt odd about making it into English, and, or rather German, and, and why would he have misgivings? He didn't know any more Chinese than I do. He has a wonderful uh, um, beginning. He calls it, uh, what does he call it? Prelude, the spirits of the songs, a prelude. And what happened to him was that the spirits of the Chinese songs, all uh, uh, 325 of them, uh, came to him personally in a vision and begged him to resurrect them for modern people in a di uh, uh, across the globe, different language, different countries, uh, and give them new life. Uh, he, he thought that maybe his lack of Chinese would be uh, a, a deterrent, but they said, oh, no, we'll help you. All the spirits of the songs and of all the other songs you've composed will be here to help you. And here's how he... Um, uh, concludes this lovely prelude. So many language spirits who are your familiars wish you well. They'll likewise be assisting you, one unknown language to compel. You sprites for heaven height designed and spring and love, no more be blind. Our rescuer with help in due that we our forms may find. But what the songs convey to me, how might I summarize and weigh? The book is here for each to see. Indeed, your life it mirror may. I hope twill please my brief collation, strange tones not lower estimation. World poetry alone may be world reconciliation. Ah, what a wonderful thought. So here he goes with Chinese poems uh, rendered by way of Latin. And I render them by way of German. He happens to be one of the very greatest poets as well as greatest, uh, one of the greatest translators Germany ever produced. He knew 44 languages and we know that's no lie or mere rumor because he was professor at the University of Erlangen. And every time he wanted to learn a new language, he would announce a course in it in the syllabus a year ahead of time, and he would be there on the first day of class, and so would the students, and he'd better be ready. Okay, let's start reading. I'm going to start with, uh, I've chosen a dozen uh, short ones to give you a sample. And I'm going to begin with maybe... I don't know. I have no in number one favorite, but this is one of my very favorites in the book. I like to uh, read poems about lovers, and this is called A Lover's Journey. 
In woods where the trees are a hiker's delight, the axles are bearing my carriage in flight. In woods where the pheasant will feathers outfling, the spokes of my wheels are a sparkle and sing. And why do I cover so many long miles in frightening darkness? My lunar light smiles on pathway and road where the perils affray. What looks at me boldly? The wakening day. I cannot be hungry nor suffer in thirst. In thoughts of my dear is my lyric immersed. I cannot feel sleepy or ever get tired, alive to the shine of your smile so desired. The rumble of wheels. Darling, open your eyes. Your bridegroom's approaching you. I'm your surprise. The tongues of the wheels bring me close to her place, where welcome awaits me with loving embrace. Now let's try number uh, 100. That's a bit uh, further back. Uh, but also, following my usual bias, it's about love. Not always uh, <laughs> under the best conditions. Let's um, let's just try try it. The wing, the queen awakes the king. Up. You hear the rooster sing, people in the palace move, freshened by the sleep of love. Don the garments of a king, echoes of the storm wind rang. You've been fooled, no rooster sang. Up, the sun of morning flares, street crowds getting loud. It's late, through the open palace gate, clouds so patient. Waiting stares. No, it's moonlight that you see. You will not be fooling me. Up the buzzing morning fly. See, it's heading straight for you. Resting is a pleasure, true, but my conscience won't comply. Duty summons from above. Now is not the time for love. Uh, he's uh, not lucky today, but in another way, I think he's extremely lucky. And now we go to an earlier stage in a romance. This is called Interpreting the Gifts of Love. I've just, I'm, I'm enthralled by the way this is presented. Uh, it's all, did you notice, soliloquies and conversations? You get to hear the ancient Chinese people talk. And also, I have to admit to you, at the same time with a great deal of uh, vicarious pride, that uh, um, Rickert invents all these forms. They aren't Chinese forms. He doesn't know any Chinese, and he doesn't comprehend Chinese forms. So he writes his own, and they're all different one from another. And he has, he's just a genius. That's, his, that's enough to say... Number 68 is called Interpreting the Gifts of Love. Into my lap you apples threw, and I returned the noble ruby seeds, not as a payment, but so you may view the mind that such an emblem heeds and get a glimpse of what my thinking feeds. Into my lap you peaches threw, and I return the noble verdant seeds. Not compensation, but that you may see how love in your direction speeds, and have a glance at what my feeling needs. Into my lap some plums you threw, and I return the noble deep blue seeds. No substitute, but letting you know well where faithful my devotion leads, and grasp what blessing that emotion breeds. Well, we can't always talk about love. Sometimes we have to talk about humdrum tasks. Here's a guy on the custodial staff in the palace, and it gets very boring patrolling the halls when no one is there and long hours in loneliness. This is called Nighttime Duties at Court. Ever dimmer is the heaven shimmer. Five stars only show an eastern brightness. Rooms we wander 
here and there and yonder, feeling lonely, never rest nor lightness. Some may be content, not all. Cares are lent and troubles call. Those in woe forlorn until the morning lift the misty pall. Even dimmer now the heaven shimmer. Two stars only show an eastern brightness. Yet we wander, wanting not to ponder, almost pronely smote by rules and rightness. Some content, their number small. Cares are lent, and troubles call. Those in woe forlorn until the morning lift the misty pall. If every moment of boredom or frustration that I ever experienced in my life, I had the capacity to write up in such lyric lines, uh, they were, the, the hardships and the burdens would be, uh, I think, sufficiently, indeed, let us say, drastically mitigated. And perhaps I do have that ability. There's only one way to tell if you have it, and that is to try it. Modest and proper. Oh, this is good for, for relief. And contrast, I picked number 51, which is about somebody who refuses to be told what to do. This is called Beauty of Unconstraint. Gaze upon the rainbow splendid, don't interpret it away. Commentators unbefriended will repent of what they say. Oh, how bright, oh, how light, comes the beauty radiant blended. Is perhaps a boy in sight who had summoned her to play, made her eyes so bright? Swift away from brother's home she wended. On the splendid rainbow gaze, yet reproach her not, I pray. Those who discommend her ways, plague of pain will later pay. Up and down, wave and sway, myriads of her brilliant rays, may be headed for a dance, or to other kinds of play, charms her flight enhance. From her parents' home she fled away. Lovely colored, fluttering, utter no reproach to her. Lips that scold, a pain will sting. Punish them that dare demur. Mist, you cloud, sudden blur, round about her strengthening. Haze with never wearied art. What of habit, blame astir. Favor she'll impart. Cheaply, nor will heed your chattering. The next one I've already had a lot of fun sharing. It's it's uh, one that I shared with my uh, uh, finan uh, marketing assistant, my marketing agent. Uh, he is very much a family man, and on on um, uh, uh, Facebook he has paid tribute to his son and his daughter and his wife, and I knew that he would enjoy this one. This is in what you could call the pre-Confucian tradition. A, a lot of these poems go very, very well with Confucianism, even though they predate that era, which suggests to me that Confucius solidified what uh, may have been uh, very much the, the going ideas for quite a long time. And uh, those two main ideas of Confucianism that I note are family love and family solidarity and collaboration along with that. And secondarily, uh, reverence for ancestors. There are a number of poems in here about forebear fest observance, in which we also venerate the emperor and his forebears. Worthy love. At the city gate we see lady choir decked festively, lightsome as a vernal cloud. Swaying each a cloudlet seems, they can weave from sunlight gleams, garb with richest hues endowed. That's my wife, all dressed in white, garments styled in artful ways. She appears more bright. Her I want to praise. 
At the city gate each girl is in grateful dance a whirl, as a flower in summer breeze. They're like summer blooms arrayed, red and white on cheek displayed. Spice aromas float with ease. That's my wife. With veil of green, made herself with heart joys seen, she at evening fast lent my spirit rest. This one's called the harried servant. This poor boy has nothing but bad luck. When before the dawn I rose, rushing, I had put my shoes on wrong. Speed demanded, master, who was strong. In whatever task he chose. So I rose before the dawn, Put my shirt on badly, Back to front, Switch it! Of abuse you'll bear the brunt, If you don't get moving on. Harmed you'll be by hedgerow thorn, When with greenery you fence the garden, Hard to serve a ruler slow to pardon, Who will roar with sudden scorn. If the night and the day you should not distinctly separate, you'll distinguish them perhaps too late by the fading evening ray. Bright and early, if you rise, by the latter eventide you'll rest when of master's plan you pass the test. Dark delays, you'll realize. You'll no longer think that your job is done when you're really only half through. Now, this is interesting. This is uh, not lament or um, jubilation. This is, what shall we call it, hard-headed reckoning, careful, calculated planning. And so the poem is fitly called Economic Arrangements. How may we flax provide? Both length and breadthwise must the land be ploughed. And how acquire a bride? Approach her parents only when allowed, by a mediator, if both concur. One hopes that the bride will the choice prefer. The wood, how best supplied? A sharpened axe will make the tree trunks fall. The wedding who'll provide? The go-between, yes, she'll arrange it all. If the axe You've sharpened is hard and strong. The tree will be falling before too long. Yes, mar marriages and uh, romances and love affairs go very, very well uh, when a dowry is guaranteed and there's been a mediator, a matchmaker at work who, of course, requires a fee. We know all about that. And then... All right, that's about practical arrangements in ancient China. And now we have something that could just as well be written by someone today. Uh, this is really quite a universally uh, applicable kind of uh, rumination. This is called Common Need and Non-Participation. Of poisonous apples grown ripe on trees, we've eaten as each may tell. If heart, though, is pierced with a deep unease, I'll sing and I'll joke as well. Whoever knows me not, supposing I'm content, suspects no fever's hot. So human lives are spent. By thinking of their own, might others feel my woe. Yet other folk themselves but little know. The poisonous plants in the garden sown we've all in our time enjoyed. My inner afflictions are bloated, grown, and yet I am not annoyed. Who knows me not will think, from troubles I am far, nor feels my spirit sink. Well, that's how people are. We're dwellers all within the realm of sorrow shared. And each must bear his burden undeclared. Well, you know, there's my dozen poems, but I, uh, uh, there's, there is such a thing called a baker's dozen, uh, which is 13. So maybe I won't stop, uh, stop with that one because 
I have, a, as you perhaps noticed, a, a, a bias in favor of uh, uh, che cheerful things, uh, or at least calm and uh, equable, equanimous. Here's a nice one to conclude with. It's called To the Favorite. The people, <clears throat> let's start that again. The people are oppressed enough. They now require a life less rough. Let blessing from your presence flow. Good deeds that to the people go. Of realm envenomers get rid, who flattering think their evil hid. And know that what you must, you can. Tis what bespeaks a mighty man. The people are enough oppressed. To ease that pressure soon is best. That true well-being tongues may know, and country homes renewed may grow. Ward off the men who but avail to make the empire's lifeblood fail. The fortune favor you may feel, use well to help the world to heal. A fair estate the folk desire, too much did fate of them require. To draw the vital workers near, the trifler hoard from court to clear, the overreaching men to tame, for whose ambition greed's to blame, needs but a gesture of your hand, you have it in you to command. A lighter fate the folk would know, that they might burdens overthrow, to duty's rule, support to lend, and threatened customs to defend, to free the land from robbers drear, the field from worms to clean and clear. Though you in years are but a youth, yet you can do these things in truth. Make lighter, then, the people's load. Be mindful of the rightful road. Let not the good be led astray, and evil people have their way, nor bloody-minded ones fulfill their greedy and oppressive will. As you, the emperor, loves well, your duties I to you must tell. Thank you for being with me this evening.